Hello History 141 students, uh, Dr. Fia here, Megan is behind the uh, camera as usual. Uh, today we want to talk about our seminar in which we read three documents uh, on the slavery issue. We read one document from William Lloyd Garrison, namely the Liberator, or the first issue of the Liberator. And then we read two pro-slavery documents, one by uh, a William and Mary a professor of political, eco econo or political economy, uh, Thomas Dew, and then another one by George Fitzhugh, a Southern politician. Uh, in my seminar, at least, I tried to put these, at least the Garrison document, into some context. When we think about the anti-slavery movement uh, in the North, it's, it's, a, it's much more nuanced than simply people who oppose slavery. You had people like Garrison, who as he argues in the Liberator, that we, the, the article that we read, the, the document that we read, you have Garrison who is an immediate emancipationist. He's an abolitionist, but he wants to free the slaves and he wants to free them now, right? Immediate emancipation. One of the groups that he counters or argues against in that piece in the Liberator that we read are the gradual emancipationists. These are people who are abolitionists. They want to free the slaves, but they want to do so gradually. So, you know, at a certain age, all slaves will go free, for example, and if you're above that age, you'll remain a slave for the rest of your life. But, um, you know, gradually slavery will slowly disappear. Now, not all anti, and listen to this carefully, not all anti-slavery advocates in the early republic, in the years prior to the Civil War, were abolitionists. You had others who believed, leave slavery alone in the South, and Abraham Lincoln takes this early, one of, one of the, his early views on this uh, is, is reflective here. Um, Abraham Lincoln says, leave slavery alone in the South, but don't let it spread to the territories. And then eventually the South would eventually die out as well in the South. Um, you know, this might be something similar to, to what they tried to do with the Northwest Ordinance. Remember that from your last exam, where they developed these five new states and did not allow slavery to exist there. So my point is the anti-slavery group is much larger than simply, you know, we oppose slavery. You have radical emancipationists or, or immediate emancipationists, you have gradual emancipationists, you have anti-slavery, uh, stop the spread. You even have others who argue, and Lincoln actually argues for this at one point as well, uh, colonization. Let's, let's free the slaves and ship them over to Liberia or some African nation uh, uh, that, that we'll create through, so they don't have to integrate into white society. Now, we, of course, looked at the two pro-slavery documents as well. Uh, again, there's a lot in those documents. They're long documents. Uh, I know we probably didn't have time to unpack them fully during seminar, but just a couple points to take away. First, on the Fitzhugh document, uh, get the crux of Fitzhugh's argument. His argument is slaves are happy Slaves are taken care of, they're clothed, they're fed, they get sleep at night, uh, they get time off, uh, versus the capitalist North, the rising market economy in the North, where you have massive numbers of immigrants coming in, working on canals and roads and, and in the industrial centers that are emerging. Fitzhugh's argument is we take care of our laboring classes, namely the slaves, better then the Northern economy takes, their, takes care of their laboring classes. Uh, you know, normal workers work way longer, in the North, I should say, work way longer than the, than the Southern slaves each day, up to 15, 16 hour days. They, they, they can't feed themselves or their family. They don't make enough money. They're in poverty. They don't get any sleep. You know, all of these arguments. So look at Fitzhugh's argument, pro-slavery argument as a strong critique of capitalism, a strong critique of the market economy as it's developing in the North in the years prior to the Civil War. And in that sense, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting argument. We take care of our laboring classes better than you do. How dare you tell us uh, that you are more moral than we are? Look at the way you treat your workers. And then you have do, which, which is, there's a multiplicity of arguments in the, in the do piece. Um, but Thomas Dew, uh, the one that I spent a lot of time with my seminar on is, Thomas Dew argues that, yes, slavery goes against 
the spirit of Christianity, right? The spirit of Christianity. But once it's introduced, once slavery is introduced to a society, to end slavery then would create all kinds of unbiblical uh, results. So he'll argue that, um, you know, if we free the slaves like the abolitionists want us to do, uh, we will create social disorder. Paul says that everybody has their place. The Apostle Paul says everybody has their place in society. You must be content in that place. You must even rejoice in the sort of place you're put in society. So for slaves to be uppity or to sla for slaves to think about rebelling or for slaves to go free, this would disrupt the God-ordained order of society. Uh, and thus, this is why, even though slavery goes against maybe the spirit of Christ, this is why we can't end it, because then it would create kind of even more, uh, it would create all kinds of even more kinds of sin by corroding society. So read those, read Garrison and read the two pro-slavery documents carefully, compare, contrast them. Think about them as well in the context, especially the Southern documents. Think of those in the context as well of Professor Snyder's lecture on the Southern economy and cotton. Uh, and if you have any questions or you want to discuss those documents further, come see myself or Professor Snyder. We'll be happy to do that. See you next time on The Office Hours.